Hi everyone and welcome to the stream. Tuesday evening lesson and some interesting stuff in chat already. Already we got some interesting stuff in chat. Anyway, we got some, look what we got behind us. Oh, yes, yeah, Rap, let's go. Srab, you subscribed for 28 months in a row. Thanks for the resub. Holy moly, man. And you guys, he is our newest, our newest moderator on our stream. And he's so quick with the, with the mouse, you know, with the links. The guy's right on top of stuff. You mention something and boom, there's a link in there. This guy's great. And thanks for your resub, Srab. That's great. 28 months, man. You guys, so many of you have been with us for the long haul. It's great. And this is what we've been doing for three years every Tuesday night. And uh, it could be a basic lesson or it could be something like this. So, Andrew, what are your thoughts on, before we get going here, on this airplane? This is a this is sweet. It was actually a surprise that snuck up on me. How about you? Yeah, I I think I've seen it, like pictures and stuff, but... Uh... Yeah, no, it's 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 not a bad little airplane. Dr. No Thumb, welcome. It was a surprise, actually, you guys. We've seen it. We thought, oh, look at that. It looks like a flying car. It looks like a something out of the 50s. Oh, wait a minute. It is something out of the 50s. Interesting enough, you guys, Mario Pilot's in the crowd with us. This is great. And I have a, a big thank you in this presentation towards him and the work that he's done on this project. Um, this is available through any builds, but... As I dove deeper to ask questions about the product, any builds sent me to the developer. And today, you guys, the developers in chat with us. And that's just awesome. So let's get on with it. What do you think, Andrew? Ready to roll? Jump uh, in. Already doing it. Already doing it. He's already taxiing out to the... Well, we got to talk about it first. But, uh, you know, here's a view from, from Andrew's screen, you guys. Here's what it looks like from the inside. Look at this. Everything you'd ever want right there in front of you. Andrew's got the optional 430 up on his screen. And that way he's got some familiarity because Andrew does have the hardware for the 430. But this is very unique, this airplane. And the, the, yeah. as I dove deeper and learned more and made this lesson, I learned more and more about this airplane the more and more I liked it. There's, there's the button there's right there. The, Go ahead, there's Andrew. the other version. Yep. There's the normal, I call it the normal radio version, like all the planes I rent. And there's the clickable right there the upper left corner to turn it into a 430. Look at that. So, you guys, who doesn't want a moving map in their airplane, you know? You know what I mean? Take a quick look on the outside, Andrew, while you're taxiing there and have a quick look at what this thing looks like. And then we'll go to lesson. Look at that. Dual boom. What a funny looking thing, though, really, when you think about it. And this thing is balanced in the air, balanced on the ground. It floats beautifully. It takes off with lots of power. It's got a familiar engine that we all know from other airplanes we've looked at already. Let's go over to our teaching screen and let's just learn a bit more about it, you guys. All right, so let's take a look at this, you guys. The, this lesson is the Riviera Amphibian. And, and there'll be different names that you'll hear here. As you see in the sim, it's called the Nardi. And there's a reason for that. And you'll also hear on the radio when you turn on, you know, obviously the, the radio that's built into the sim, you'll hear your virtual co-pilot call it the Nardi when he talks to the tower. So that's what it's called. And it's the FN333. And so FN actually stands for the initials of the original developer of the plane. Way back, way back, way back. Now, I, ch I just changed this label after we saw the conversation in chat with Mario Pilot when he mentioned that it's already been applied to be put into the marketplace for the Xbox. So I changed it right now because I did say available for PC only. And I think later on there's one other mention, but I couldn't scroll fast enough when we were counting down um, to go find it. But this, later on I'll say for PC only, but I'm going to make mention of that, that it's actually available for Xbox. And Andrew and I were talking about that just before it started. We were both combing the marketplace to see if it's available so we could answer that question. And um, and then we see Mario Pilot answers it for Oz right there directly. And it was like, yes! Which is, you guys, when you see that there's 12 million users in this sim, a lot of those users are also Xbox. So you got to think about half the market. I don't know if it's half exactly. I haven't heard the numbers. But uh, there could be 6 million users out there going, it's not for Xbox? Eh. So, you know, all developers are smart if they can make an Xbox version of these things and let people fly along with us. Just like the Spitfire way back in the day, Andrew. So this is the baby we're going to take a look at, you guys. What, what about it? You know, let's just find out about it. As you guys know, I do some type of presentation. 
As with any new airplane, there's definitely briefings on the ground. There's definitely learning involved. Um, some airplanes take a few days to learn before you can go for your check ride. Many airplanes take a week or two. As you get into the bigger, more complex planes, you might take a month or two to learn the airplane before you actually go for your check ride and get certified, type certified, as that's what you call it. Um, and that means that you're allowed to take the plane out now and go solo and whatever. And so here in these sessions on a Tuesday night, we do it all in one evening. Everything you need to know, but you were afraid to ask. And then we go for a fly. So if you guys do have this plane, maybe you can pick up a few tidbits tonight. There's a lot of things that we already know. This thing has a standard six pack. It has a standard radio stack. It has a standard 430. There's things in here that are easy. Many of you have been flying uh, with levers for uh, manifold pressure and RPM, the blue lever as we call it. Yep, that's the same here. So there's a lot of similarities. It's really just cockpit orientation. Where is everything? And what's unique about this plane? What are the features, right? So as you guys have been reading while I've been talking here, you can see it's an Italian luxury touring amphibious aircraft. It's like, it's, it's a luxury touring amphibious. I mean, who owns these things, you know? And uh, who can afford to own these things? <laughs> Uh, Fratelli Nardi, and there's where it gets the name Nardi from. That's the FN designation, and produced in small numbers afterwards. It's interesting that he invents it, but he doesn't produce it in large numbers. But um, the SM afterwards, and everybody's heard of Machete, Marchetti, during the following decade. So um, it's it's around the world, but mainly to the USA. Stout hull fuselage, high wing airplane and uh, twin boom sail, uh, tail assembly. High wing is important, you guys, first of all, when you're on the water. It keeps the spray of the water, especially ocean salt water, away from the wings and the motors. And then being a pusher prop also creates some very interesting effects on the water, pushing the spray of the floats back further behind. It also gives you better isolation of the sound. So a lot of home builds that I've been in and that I've seen have pusher props. And, uh, and it gets everything way behind you out of the way and the sound is way back there too. So this is, this, it's amazing. And, and the view out the windows of course are great because it's all that, uh, all that glass all around. A minivan of seaplanes, yeah, absolutely. And uh, seats four, um, and there is, a, there is a trim setting on takeoff on the water. There's a trim setting, whether it be for one person or more than one, as they say in the manual, right? Uh, for one person, it's you, you, you trim to zero on your on your elevator trim, but when there's more than one, you trim for for a plus ten, and that's a, that's part of the weight and balance idea behind it, right? We'll go take a look at weight and balance here. So a handful still exist for adventurers. Don't know how much longer they'll stay around, but I do want to mention to you that there were plans to make it a folding wing design. This is important. It never actually got to production, or at least nobody knows if it ever got to production. There never was one scene. But the interesting part about the design of this was that the fuel cells, there's fuel cells, I won't go to a fuel cell part of the POH, but interestingly and and to my surprise and my delight, the, the, the original POH was modified to become the manual for this plane. And that's very important, you guys. As you know, when I do these lessons, I go straight to a POH if there's no manual or there's a SIM manual, but it's very brief. And so I always go to the POH to find more information. Here I didn't have to do that because it supplies a POH. Um, I think they just call it the flying handbook, but it's still in POH format. And it's got everything you ever need in there. And so when you look at the fuel layout, and there's fuel cells, of course, in the wings, like, like most airplanes, right close to the fuselage. But there's also some outboard fuel cells right here in this part that folds. And those outboard fuel cells, that's the reason it folds like it does. But there's a second reason. But wait, there's more. There's a second reason that it folds like this, and that's to keep the floats in the water and keep you stabilized. Is that cool or what? I'd never, I'd never heard of that before. <laughs> now, folding on the land, of course, the wheels keep, keep the floats from touching. But when you're folding it in the water, which they do, and then they haul it up either with a winch or, or push it or whatever, push it onto the beach, they'll uh, still have these things touching the water until they get up there. But anyway, it's kind of interesting. Hydraulic jacks. Now, this whole plane is powered by hydraulics. So the flaps themselves are hydraulic. Uh, the wheels are hydraulic. All of them are hydraulic, right? So just keep that in mind, which is very unique in this plane because a lot of planes have direct linkage with this size of plane. This is what it looks like in the sim when you have it. And there are the liveries that come with it. I haven't seen any show up yet on flightsim.to, but you can bet there'll be more. And this really does make it look like the era that it came from. 
like the music I was playing. It's the 50s into the 60s. Um, First Flight, you'll see in a second here, First Flight was um, in December, I think it's December 4th of 1952. And that's a long time ago, before many of us were born. But you know, the whole point is that it didn't actually come into big production until 62, a decade later. It's like, wow. And um, you know, many factors decide whether a plane gets made a lot or not. It, many times, as you guys know, many times it's because the plane actually makes it into the military use and then thousands more get made, you know, that kind of thing, once there's money behind it. So so I do credit IndieBuilds because they are the um, distributor, if you will, and they are the ones, that's the label you'd look for when you're trying to find it. Um, but as you'll see that, um, as you'll see, Mario Pilot is the actual developer of it. So let me just show you this, the power bindings first. This is the simple stuff, you guys. I always go to this first before we get into the seven steps. All right, the throttle levers here on the left. Here we see over in the right, the propeller, the two main ones that you'll need. And then as you get above 3000, then you would start using a mixture lever. As with all airplanes like this, all right, that very similar, very familiar look. I can see right now my trim is way up there for some reason. Um, interestingly, the trim indicator here, your elevator trim indicator has uh, a black part of the dial and the blue and white part of the dial. So it's very easy to tell at a glance. At first I didn't like it because in the sim you have to get right down there sometimes with the cursor keys just to get down and look at this thing to see what your trim is at. And um, and then I found that you could just glance and see if you've got some black and white and some blue and then you know you're around zero. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> you could tow it around in a boat trailer. Yes, yes, right behind your caravan, right? Oz, did I get it right? Your caravan, right? So that's the idea, you guys. Put your throttle quadrant in your right hand and your stick in your left and away you go, all right? All right, technical specs. Yeah, I was right, December 4th, 1952. Um, you'll hear different names for it, but in sim, you'll hear it called the Nardi, right? But uh, these people were all involved in getting this out the door. Here's an actual picture, black and white photo from the day where four of them got together out in the field somewhere, probably an air show, probably a fly-in, go get together and compare your colors. We can't tell what the different colors are here, but it's definitely got that 50s look, you know, that rocketeer kind of look, you guys. Look at the front of it here with the, with the lines. Kind of interesting, isn't it? Um, civilian General Aviation. Now, this, in, this uh, power plant, we're going to have a look at that with a little more detail. The IO-470P. 250 horsepower pusher prop. The original design had the O470 at 225 horsepower. So, you know, they just beefed it up another 25 horsepower with a fuel injected version of it. Yeah. Let's see, range 352 nautical miles. Yeah, baby, let's go. Uh, so they could go quite a distance. Ceiling 24,000, but I never saw any provision. Did you, Andrew, for oxygen on board? So that might be their ceiling. And it's obviously because they have variable pitch, but there's no oxygen. And I think I think by law, you're supposed to have oxygen on board. Someone correct me. If there's a CFI in the crowd, correct me. I think by law, you have to have oxygen on board after 11,000 feet. And you know, I, I fly Cessnas that can go to 15. I've never been above 10. I don't have oxygen on board. And I just don't wanna, you know, like die up there. But uh, anyway, cruise at 140 knots, you guys. That's pretty decent. It's faster than a 172. And it can land on the water. So here's the airplane, you, uh, sorry, here's the, the engine, you guys. This is the engine that's in the plane. It's a six cylinder horizontally opposed, air cooled. And you know, this is the same, you know, we've seen lots of these in these lessons that we've been doing. Two spark plugs, one at the bottom, one at the top here per cylinder, um, two oh. magnetos. Um, this is fuel injected for this version, which is good. It's more reliable fuel injected. You don't have to worry about uh, a carburetor and carb ice and stuff like that. Uh, direct drive straight out. Andrew, what, what are you going to jump in there with? Uh, I was just going to say, I did not realize that because I had I had, I went to, to any builds to buy it. I hadn't been to the developer's website. We have another one of Mario's aircraft. The Caproni Vizzoli C-22J Ventura, the little 152 jet. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, that's from one of, uh, Mario. That's, wow, it. that's one of his. The hidden developer here. Wow. You're going to get some fame with all the streamers now knowing who you are. See? See, 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 and uh, and this is where you bring it, you guys. Bring it to the streamers, and then we'll show everybody what it is if it's a good thing. This is a good thing, you guys. I don't spend days making a lesson on something that's not good. 
So you guys know that already. The same engine is found in famous airplanes such as the Navion Rangemaster. Now we've covered a couple of Navions that Nick made, but uh, the Rangemaster, we don't have that one. The Cessna 310, the 185, we all know the Bonanza for sure. Uh, there's actually, you guys, if you were to look at the list, the list of Beechcraft versions that use this engine, something like a dozen, right? Uh, the Belanca 260 and the Rolls Royce 310, but that was just to name a few of you guys. This is a very popular engine and very reliable. As a matter of fact, they call this engine, I don't know if I wrote it in here. Yeah, old reliable right here. The 0470, a lot of pilots call it the old reliable, all right, in the Cessna 180 and the 182s. Matter of fact, there's something like eight different Cessnas that use this plane, this engine also. The, o, the 0470, the carbureted version, you guys. Anyway, it's, it's, you know, that's good to know. Uh, we've got dependability okay. under the hood. You know what I mean? Uh, oh, it's in development. Yeah. Master H is Nick. Yep, that's Nick. Nick is working on that. Nick is here, you guys. I was just mentioning the Navion, the Range Master. He's working on it. Hey, that's great. I hope you bring it here first, Nick. Bring it here first. Let's dive in and show the world this thing. Let's do it. This is without the left auxiliary, right auxiliary full, you guys. You know, you know. Um, but you can fill those up too. Um, I changed the weights here. This isn't your default screen. Everything's default on here except the weights of the passenger. Uh, the uh, pilot and the co-pilot. It has something ridiculous in here, like 117 pounds for the pilot. And who knows, 102 or something. I forget what the defaults were. And I thought, oh, it's not realistic. Certainly the lighter, the better when it comes to these float planes. But stuff you know, crew weights will be changed for next update. Yeah, okay, Mario, no worries. Um, I just changed it. I just noticed it and changed it. But you know, most people wouldn't notice it. They don't go to the weight and balance in the sim. In real life, it's a compulsory thing. You got to do it. It's life and death. And so, you know, an unbalanced plane or an overweight plane is just not going to fly once you're off the ground or once you try to get off the ground. Here are the seven steps, you guys. I've learned, I've changed one thing here on number three. Number three is normally learn about, um, I don't even remember what number three is. Oh, multiple engines. Yeah. <laughs> How many years have we been doing this? Multiple engines. Yeah. But here there's only one engine. So I, I've turned this number three into learn water operations because that's important here. Um, you could actually, and I've done, I've taken this plane to extremes just to test the limits of it. And I've porpoised along the water and then finally got off the ground or off the water and then took it straight in. I mean, it just naturally went straight in. So if we don't do this right, we could do the same thing. You're porpoising along and then taking the plunge. And that's obviously not good in real life. We want to fly it properly. And that's what we're here for, to learn how to fly it properly. Hey, thanks for those who are just joining in. Welcome to the stream. We are already started on the lesson. Bring your friends. You know what I'm saying? It's interesting. And this is a fun plane to fly, you guys. A GA, as we normally do on this channel. And uh, this one's a lot of fun. Seven steps, you guys. So let's go take a look. The seven steps. So we'll use the, uh, and I'm calling it the Anybuilds Flight Manual because that's where you buy the product, you guys. Um, not realizing who the developer was until I started asking questions. Uh, one of the questions I had was about the reverse propeller. Reverse propeller, you guys. This is awesome. Reverse propeller. I can back away from a dock instead of being pushed and hope that it doesn't drift back into the dock. You know what I mean? This is good. And so um, let's go see how that works. Now, as I've mentioned before, you should read the whole manual. We do this in real life. Before we get certified on a plane, we know the manual inside out. We know every section. We know all the emergencies. We know everything about it. You have to because you're going to be grilled about it while you're in the plane. When you go for a check ride to be type certified on this plane, they would be asking questions that you would only find in the POH. So that's important. Make checklist cards and understand it top to bottom. Well, the checklists are in here, but there's also an in-game checklist, which is very easy to use, you guys. I'm going to use the POH for my checklist today. So the manual is complete, no modification. This one is a modification of the real manual, so no other references needed. You'll find that in your community folder, in your aircraft document, in a documents folder, you guys. And there it is, the MND FN 333 Aircraft Flight Manual. That's the one. And don't forget to read the README text. Nobody reads the README text. What's wrong with it? You should say, you know what? They should label this thing, do not read me. And people go, why not? And then they'll go, look, right? So. <laughs> I don't know. There's a name for that. Is it called reverse psychology? I don't know what that is called. Uh, so there we go, you guys. Uh, 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 Mario Pilot. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And so uh, not for real real world operations for simulator use only. But it's interesting that the manual comes from a real world POH. Hey, Dr. Notham's got the plane also, you guys. Let's come back here for a second. 
There's Andrew waiting patiently. And then here's Dr. Notham. Look at that. The two of them are right there, ready to go. Dr. Notham's parked right beside me. Yeah. <laughs> Strap doesn't have a link for the README. <laughs> he had everything except that. Holy moly, man. What's wrong with you? <laughs> of course not. But, uh, you know, that's pretty... It's important, you guys, and that's why I mentioned it. So let's come back here, and uh, let's go have a look here, you guys. So the vital speeds, I put in the most important ones, you guys. You can learn about all the speeds as you go through. This time I didn't make all kinds of colored markers in here, which is actually not a bad idea. But um, these are things you have to memorize. I mean memorize. I mean, seriously, when you get in an airplane and the instructor says, all right, we're going to do a, a performance takeoff over a 50-foot uh, obstacle. Performance takeoff, 50-foot obstacle. What do you set? What's your VX? Um, just a minute. I'll go look in the manual. They don't want you... I mean, there's times you do have to look in the manual because you don't memorize everything. You can't memorize the whole manual. But And you should know where to find things in the manual. But still, they might expect you to know these things that you're seeing in front of you right now by heart so that you don't have to go look it up. All right? So these are the things you jot down. And even if you have to, the first few times, and, and I used to do this the first, probably the first year I was flying Cessna 172s, I would always in the margin just write down VY, VX, VSO, my stall speed with flaps out. Um, the cruise and stuff I didn't have to because you got the green and red on the screen on your airspeed indicator. Um, even the landing, you could, you could almost guess, you know, the flap range is here. This is important. If, the, if, it's a, if it's got colors in the airspeed indicator, as you guys know, the Wildcat didn't, you know, so what do we do now? But when you see this, the green is your operating range without flaps, so the stall speed is 65. But you can see in here the stall speed with flaps, with flaps, is lower than that. The white flap range is our stall speed, which is around 58, 59. All right, and that's our stall speed. Let's stay above that in all operations. You're supposed to be at least 1.3 above that for every operation you're doing. So I would say keep your needle no lower than here. All right, so you don't fall out of the sky. Same with takeoff too, you guys. You got to get your takeoff up there 65 and higher. You're going to rotate at 65, I think. Uh, VR 66. We're going to rotate right here. And you're never going to let it drop further, right? Keep it up here for safety, all right? That's what we're thinking about. Cruise at 140. Well, I've had this thing all the way up to never exceed, just to see if it would vibrate itself. But it was okay. And I said, I better back that off a little. Flaps under 112, gear under 120. Um, and we also think about, it's not on here, but in water operations, we have to think about the uh, tip tanks, or if you want to call them the floats. They call them the floats, the floats lever. So the floats, I think, is 108 knots. So if you think about 108, 112, 120, so gear can come down first, flaps can come down next, and as you get down into the 108 range, down come the tip tanks if you're landing on water. All right, so just remember those three in a row, right? Landing 65, yep. Yeah. It can be higher, but it's just violent. You know, when you come in at 75 on the water, it's just, you know, it's just, and that, you'll see it. This thing is a bubble at the front, and when it cuts the water, it just, goes right over the windshield. Some really nice, really nice effects there. All right. Um, the vital speeds is next. Number two, uh, learn the vital speeds, the V speeds. Here it's the cruise speeds. We already just had a look at the main ones, the stall speed and all the rest of it. But now we're looking at cruise. This is your first taste of the manifold pressure gauge and the RPM gauge. And I put in here some diamonds just to show you the range. You see, I love it when they put colors in you guys. Here's our green range. Stay within that unless you're coming in for a landing, and then you'll be down in here. Same with the RPMs in here, 21 to 24, 2450. 21 to 24, that's the only range you have other than reverse prop. So this is your uh, RPMs uh, with your blue with your blue lever. Yeah. What's that, Andrew? I'm just flipping through the uh, manual. Stall speed in knots at 3,270 pounds gross weight, Gear flaps and wing floats up, i.e. everything retracted. Stall is in level flight 65. With gear down, floats up and flaps at 45 degrees. Stall speed is 59. 59. And if you put the floats down, so everything is complete. Yeah, gear up, floats down, flaps down, 58. 58. So there, I was saying 58 to 59. Wow, that was cool. Is this a Buick? I think so, Rad. <laughs> 
So if you put the gear down and the floats up, it stalls at 59. If you put the gear up and the floats down, it stalls at 58. So there's your there's your there's your landing stall speeds. Beautiful. Thanks for that, Andrew. 50, yeah, that's what we 50, need. Fifty nine on ground and fifty eight in the water. Fifty eight in the water. So you guys, um, that's right here on the dial. You can see where we're guessing just by looking at the the gauge. And I said I always trust the gauge, and you can see that um, I was guessing at fifty eight, fifty nine. Just guessing, and that's actually yep. the numbers. Way to go, Andrew. Yep. You confirmed it. Yep. So you guys, when you see here manifold pressure and RPM, this is your typical gauges that you use to figure out your cruise settings. And cruise settings, the lower the numbers, typically the lower the numbers, the more fuel savings you'll have. Right now I've got, these are actual settings that you see in the plane as I was trying different cruise settings. I tried to mimic what you see here, 2450 on the RPM, MP gauge 24, and uh, fuel pressure 8.6. Okay, fuel pressure 8.6. Well, I was pretty close then. I thought it was gallons per hour at first because that's what I usually use in 172s and other planes, but it's actually fuel pressure. Now, fuel pressure is a pressure gauge to see if you've got enough fuel. If you put on your, if you put on your fuel pump to low, or even to high in emergencies, but low when you're taking off and when you're landing, it will give you 8.6. But a normal would be around four for fuel pressure, four or five in a lot of planes, most planes. Um, and here we see. Um, so 2450, which is what you're seeing here for RPM, 2450 right there. And you're seeing 24 in the MP gauge, which is right there. So I, I did the max cruise kind of idea just to see what I would get. And then I used my mixture to try and pull this down to see how we go. But you can see here your gallons per hour. That's the most you get in cruise. You can see here, if you go back to 2100, bring this back to 21, which is the low end right here. And then, um, and then 22 over here on the MP gauge, then you can see you can be sipping fuel at 9.7 and all the way down to 7.7, depending on your altitude also. So, you know, and then your range, your range goes up as you're saving fuel, of course, right? So it's kind of interesting, you guys. You can see I was actually nailing 141, just like it says right here, 141 worked. It worked. So it's very accurate. It comes out to just like it says, this is the real POH, you guys. And this thing actually works out accordingly. Now this is at 2,500 feet. There's performance charts in the POH for different altitudes all the way up. I think it gives us up to 10,000. You know, it's gonna run out of pages if it keeps giving us a chart like this for every altitude. And obviously as the air gets thinner, the fuel mixture has to change and things have to change. So, and then all the way up to 22,500. Wow. Yeah, they do 25, five, 75, 10, and 15. Per cruise performance at 2500 basically 500 foot or 2500 foot increments right so 25 5000 7500 and etc and then and then it goes and then we you get to 10 and then it jumps right to 15. and then we use the, the teacher expression etc <laughs> and so on and so on uh, get or make a checklist. I've made many of them for different planes we've reviewed and had a lesson on, but this one comes with its own checklist already built in. Now it's in, there's an in-sim checklist, of course, which many of you will use. What I like about the in-sim checklist, you guys, is that it stays on your screen. If you pull in any other document, you're either looking over at it or you're trying to put it on your screen. And when you, when you touch the simulator, the document disappears, right? You got to go find it again. So I'll do something similar here where we can see it. Um, on our screen and I can scroll it. Uh, but we could use the InSim one if we have to. But this is part of it right here. You're seeing here normal procedures. That's the section. This is section two. Now normal POH is normal procedure is section four, but this is the way this POH was made. So that's fine. Maybe back in 1952 to 62, they still hadn't solidified the standard yet because typically section three is emergency section four we think about this and section four is uh, the normal procedures, but that's okay. As long as we can find it in the manual and we know where to get to it, if we have to reference it along the way. But this is why I say we should take these checklists and print them, laminate them, I double side them, laminate them and keep them in the cockpit with you. Um, you'll see um, in the IFR course that I just finally released, you guys heard about it, you were here for the launch party. Um, I recommend in there you always keep pencils and notepads nearby. Every IFR pilot still writes stuff down. And I see some using a tablet with their finger. They cannot write enough information on one page in a tablet, and that tablet could all of a sudden die. Pencils and paper are the most reliable things still to this day 
and uh, a lap, you know, a knee board as they call it, that straps to your leg, uh, which I do use when I do the IFR flights. So that should happen here too. You should have a checklist that's easy accessible. You tuck it into a pouch, you tuck it in beside the dashboard, or you tuck it in under your, your other leg, and it's always there. You need it, boom. You need it, boom. All right. Now, obviously, you get into the airliners, you got lots of room in the cockpit. You can have it certainly on one of your MFDs. You can have a, a backup MFD that has it on. So you've got this backup system of checklists that you can use. But here on these GA planes, we don't have that kind of room in the cockpit. And we're not going to be leafing through the POH every time we want to do a checklist. This is the way to go, you guys. And, and I have these laminated for every plane that I've been flying. All right, so it goes through great detail in here, more detail than you'll get with the um, in-sim checklist, which is good. Um, not everybody wants to go through every single step in the POH. I get that, you guys. Even the push to test. In the sim, they're going to work, right? You push to test every time. It works every time. But in real life, you're pushing to make sure all those lights aren't burned out. It's exactly like in a car, you guys. If you'll notice in the car, if you pause when you turn the key just before you start, I know a lot of cars don't have keys anymore, but when you first power on the car, all the dashboard lights come on. Your oil light, your check engine light, your, you know, all the idiot lights, everything else. All those lights come on in your dashboard. It's telling you all those lights are good. The filaments are good. They'll actually light up if they need to. That's important, but most people don't even realize what that's all about. Here, we have to actually push to test to make sure everything is working. And then those, we know that those lights will come on when we need them, right? All right, learn about the blue knob. Well, I'm not going to go into any elaborate. If you want to learn more about this blue knob, I did elaborate in the Wildcat session, right? Which is two ago, or maybe it was the Bronco session. <laughs> maybe it was last Tuesday. But anyway, within the last two weeks on a Tuesday night, in our lesson, I said, let's elaborate because we haven't elaborated for a long time on what this propeller lever really does. And so there's extra points and uh, extra time given to that. But here we won't go into that in great detail. We know now that this controls the RPM, or it seems to control it. The governor actually controls it. And in planes that do have variable pitch propellers, this is very common to see this lever. In your home cockpit, it'll be your blue lever. And that will control our RPM. All right, cockpit orientation, let's go. And this, this manual is just chalked full. Now you notice in here, it's got all kinds of diagrams with telling you what every single instrument is for. And actually, between this page here on the left with the cockpit picture and this page on the right telling you what all those things are. So the details I'm not going to talk about are here in the manual. I'm not going to go through all this, you guys. It's boring. If, unless you go fly it, unless you need those switches, unless you need to read that gauge. You could probably do like I do. You know the six pack is there, you can fly the thing. What do I need to know about water operations? What do I need? You do the need to know thing and then it won't get boring, all right? Nothing more boring than, okay, now let's talk about switch number 32. And after that, we're going to switch number 33. It's like, yawn. Okay, so we'll, we'll learn about you guys. In real life, of course, you got to know all this stuff, but here in the sim, it's like, give us a break. Okay, let's give you a break. So you guys know the control key plus number keys for all the different views. This is a good view here. Look at the nice big levers. One's for gear, one's for the wingtip floats, and one is for the flaps. And there's your hydraulics right there. And your power levers right above. And your parking brake, if you're on the land. Switch number 32. Yeah, that's the important one. Don't touch number 32. <laughs> it's the ejector. Boing. So um, you'll be, you guys are going to be surprised where we're going to fly with this thing. We're not telling you yet. Wait till you find out. This is so cool. Yeah. From your crummy laptop. Well, mainframe is in the shop. You got a mainframe? Yeah, crummy laptop. Yeah, well, it's always good to have a crummy laptop as a backup, you know? Um, so I just call it the six pack, you guys. There's no need explaining that. If you don't know what the six pack is, there'll be some of you in chat that don't know this yet. And I'm sorry, but we don't have time in one evening to go through every instrument. All right. The six pack is common in most airplanes. It's all the common functions you need to fly. If you want to learn more about that, I do have a beginner course on Udemy. Sorry, I have to plug it, but people don't know about it. So I have a beginner course that teaches all these basics of flying on Udemy.com. And if you need a discount for that, to jump in there, if you find that price too prohibitive, let me know and we'll see what we can do. Dr. Notham, that's awesome. Look at this. Woo! 
Ooh, I like it. What a beautiful plane. What a beautiful plane. What a beautiful plane. Did I say that already? You guys, so um, all the water... Now, these are interesting on this on this cockpit, you guys. The water land indicators. Kind of an interesting setup. Never seen one like it before. And it definitely... You know, the, the middle one's your floats, your wingtip floats. If you're heading to the water, that thing's actually flashing. How does it know you're heading to the water? It's flashing away. It's like, oh, i got to do my wingtip floats. But, you know, you should be getting ready for that ahead of time, right? Um, you notice, let's just work our way around from the six-pack... The navigation now if you take a look at this right now the six pack plus the two navigation vor cdis are exactly like a 172. you fly a 172 you can fly this plane all right and then just go off the land and back on the runway until you get to know the water operations all right um the water rudder there's a, a note somewhere in the poh there's also <laughs> a note i've made here so the water rudder you guys is interesting a switch right up here nice and you know right up by the top of the dash where an indicator light is on when the water, water rudder is down. The indicator light is yellow. That's a caution light. It's not showing yellow here. I don't have it. I don't have it down in the down position. But this switch puts the water rudder at the back of the airplane down. And that's interesting. Now you can still use control W, I think it is, um, if you want to just do the shortcut. And you can also map any of these things, of course. But the water rudder is used when you're below 45 knots. So in other words, you're not flying yet. Remember, we don't fly until 65. So below 45. So even when you're taking off, you can still use it. In most seaplanes, you take off the water rudder when you're ready for takeoff. You raise the water rudder because you'll wreck it. It's a piece of aluminum at the back of your airplane. And you go above 45, you'll probably bend it or even break the linkage. It's a, water is a big force, right? So typically on takeoff, you raise the rudder before you take off in any checklist. Here, they allow it right up to 45 knots. So as you're speeding up to take off on the water, don't forget to raise it at 45. It should be your first thing you do because you're not ready to rotate yet, all right? Get that thing off the water. And it also adds some drag too, you guys. So you get it up out of the water. Anyway, that's cool, it's right there. Uh, this little click spot right here, it says right on it, it says GTN 430, and it changes this panel here, the audio and this one, into a 430 like Andrew has, all right? And that's what that little click spot is for right there. And a lot of people will do that. Um, I still rent Cessnas today, uh, 152s, uh, 150s and 172s that still have four displays like this, two radio stacks with Cam, with COM1, uh, COM2, NAV1, NAV2. So this is very familiar to me, but it is old fashioned, you guys. Some of the planes I rent are actually, one of them I rented was 1956. I'm serious. Uh, the plastic parts inside were, were all, you know, rad. All they were, they were a mess, and they were kind of flapping as we were landing. It was an old plane, <laughs> but you know, they keep the engines going in the airframes, of course, in top notch. But I'm used to seeing that. But you know, a lot of you will want GPS. The one thing you can't do here is GPS. You can do autopilot, and autopilot can lock on to your heading, which is what I'll show you in the demo. Autopilot can also lock on to nav, so that you, you can still do all of that. You just can't do GPS with this configuration. There's your transponder. Oh, by the way, the, the, the autopilot's the CAP 140. We all know that from WB Sim, right? And other planes. Fuel pump. This is important at the start and, and the landing. Sorry, at takeoff and landing. As with a lot of checklists, you have this extra electric fuel pump that helps you to ensure you have fuel so you don't have fuel starvation in that first 500 or the last 500 feet. You know, that idea. Um, you don't need it at any other time, and you only use the low position. The high position is only used in an emergency, all right? As with all the engines we've learned about so far, they all have their own fuel pumps once they get running, right? And you should see that when you see the fuel pump pressure. Hydraulics over here, making sure that works. Suction is needed for your gyro instruments. Um, gyro instruments right here, one and two right there. Your heading indicator is a gyro instrument, and so is your uh, artificial horizon. We need that suction, but you know, there's suction in the engine for other things too. Your flaps indicator, hard to see here. It's right underneath that control yoke right there. But that's important, you guys, because there are many positions here, and it's hydraulically operated, so it's very fast. It's not as slow as electric. But uh, it's fast, but uh, it's still a lot of positions. You might think you've lowered 20 degrees of flaps with two notches, like in a 172. But you haven't. You've only got to 10. <laughs> so you got to do two more. And it's the same kind of operation. 
you know, you hit your flap switch down, it goes down another probably 10 degrees or so. Then you go down another, five, another, or up five, and up. It's five, de five degrees per notch. Five, that's why it's so slow. It's fast to get there, but it's so many different notches because zero to 10 for takeoff, all right? And then from then on, let me think about it, there might even be up to 20 for takeoff, but, but 30 and above for landing, all right? It makes sense, 30 and above is more drag. So drag for landing, lift for takeoff. Okay, what am I pointing at yeah. here? Okay, the autopilot, that's what I'm pointing at. What are you going to say, Andrew? Well, I was just uh, Mario saying, in the real aircraft, it doesn't have notches. It just, you push the switch down and the flaps go mm. down until you let the switch up. Right, yeah. And there, I was in a Cessna 180 once it was like that. Um, you just push it down and hold it and just watch the needle until, okay, that's what I want. You let go. And then he just confirms by looking at the, the flaps gauge. And there it is again over in the left, you guys. Well, right behind me. There's the flaps gauge right by my face there. All right. And in the meantime, Rad's making me drink some fuel. Um, take a look here, you guys. This is autopilot. You guys have already been studying the screen. Look at this. You can see the whole gear configuration here. These are all just indicators, you guys. These are not push buttons. Um, and look at this. Gear up with a red indicator, gear down with a green. And this is very interesting how this works. I'm going to see it as in action, but here we are in cruise at 2000 and I've got the autopilot on. I'm doing a heading hold and I'm just using the heading bug, you guys. We can't see that from here. It's over to the left, but um, what I did want to point out is I just set 2000 and it worked. And you know what, Andrew, this worked easily. I don't know why I stumbled through the one in the um, in the WB sim because it's connected to uh, a 430, 530, right? So I don't know if that's why. Uh, I think a lot of times with a 430 or the 530, you guys, it catches me because I go to do an autopilot with nav and it defaults to V-lock. And this one might too also. And so it's trying to follow, um, it's trying to follow an ILS or something. But, you know, I'm trying to do a GPS autopilot and I got to go up to the 430 and flip it to, to GPS. I think that's what catches me. It's not necessarily the cap 140, but... These are all standard um, radio stack stuff that you see. This is ADF down here, you guys. Um, why, I don't know why I have a 1240 in my transponder, but maybe because ATC told me to at that point. But And uh, and there's our fuel pump, always low for takeoff and landing and off for other times. And you have a nice close-up view of everything here. But there's autopilot working. It works like a charm, you guys. It works beautifully. I took this right out of the manual. Now that I see it on a bigger screen, it's like, ooh, that's kind of ugly. But these are the names of the inst of the radio stack stuff that you have, and uh, GNS four hundred and thirty is very handy. Okay, key features. I pulled this right off the Anybuilds website, you guys, and I actually showed you a couple of pictures of the four hundred and thirty up close, so you can see what it looks like. Some of the screens on here. I did a YouTube video probably years ago now on working with the five hundred and thirty and four hundred and thirty, so you can change these different pages in your nav area. Typically, a lot of us stay on this screen here. We've still got our radios, we've still got our nav frequencies, and we've got information along our journey. So this is very common. This is why people are using these. Give you more information, give you a safer flight. So key features right off their website, Amphibian, and the water spray visual and sound effects are awesome, you guys. And I have to say that because being a pusher, the water sprays differently from the plane. And every plane's front end cuts the water differently. Although you can see in these pictures, it's definitely a flying boat. There's no doubt. It's got that very common V-hull that you see, the step halfway back, which is where you want to be when you're taking off. Um, the retractable wing floats we heard about, we saw Andrew do a, a, a retract and back. The anchor system, very interesting. Docking operations made simple, and it really works well, and I like it. And uh, one of the things I had to figure out, and this is the fun of why I do this, you guys, I, I spend days figuring out the plane, and then I ask any fine, fine detail questions the day before the lesson. So that's when I started um, um, talking to any builds and then eventually over, over to um, the developer. So one of them was about retracting the anchor. Other than the sticky note that you can click to retract it, can I not pull the retrieval wire, the retrieval rope? And I guess the sim doesn't let us do that, but that's how you do it in real life. And the retrieval rope, I mean, I'll show you when we get to the when we get to the plane, but the front of the plane has the connect point, the towing point, if you want to call it that. It's actually called the cleat. And that front part is where your anchor 
is anchored, is connected, and that carries the whole weight of the plane while you're in the water while it's being anchored. Well, to retrieve that rope, someone would have to swim out there and grab the anchor rope and pull it back to the door and give it to somebody. So, of course, you got to have some way to retrieve that. Or a hatch up front like the goose has, right? The Grumman goose has a hatch up front. You just come up to the hatch and you can pull the rope in and put the anchor in, right? So, um, they have a retrieval line. And the retrieval line goes back to the door. You open your door, grab the retrieval line, and it will bring the, the anchor into you. And then you leave it on the seat all nice and wet. And I also noticed with this design too, that when the doors open, the water level is very close to that door, <laughs> the level of the door. So we're gonna go look at some winter operations, I mean, so some water operations, and we're gonna just see how cool that is. Reversible propeller, use with care. And uh, I used it to pull away from a beach. So I beached it right up onto the beach. And then when I wanted to leave, I just did a reverse prop and came back out. Oh, that's awesome. You could do pushback, you guys, and in real life, people would get friends to push you, and you know, there's all that. Um, I've been in a float plane. It was a Challenger home built. We pushed it. We just went barefoot. We pushed it into the water. We were up to our knees, and then we hopped in, flew the plane with bare feet. But you know, um, they probably did that back in the day too. But I did notice docking operations. I'm going to show you that. Just see what that's all about, you guys. On a real hard dock. All right. In sim checklist, full documentation included, and I have to agree, that's beautiful. Now I use this view here on the four on the four thirty because it's easier to read than uh, than looking over at the heading indicator, right? So I mean, it's it's bright, and at night this lights up when the heading indicator is a bit dim. So it's like in any airplane, I would choose this because it gives you the numbers right across the screen like this. Um, it's just a preference, you guys. It doesn't have to happen, right? But if you're going to follow GPS, make sure this is on GPS with your CDI uh, soft key. <laughs> because that's the one that catches me every time. It starts out in V-Log and then you wonder why your autopilot is not working right. But I think this is the default view people will pick anyway. Anyway, this isn't a lesson on that. All right, so in this picture here, I'm showing you the, uh, the anchor. This anchor line is going down into the water. And here's the anchor retrieval line over here. But I couldn't do anything with the line. I thought maybe this would be a click spot, but it's just, there's a way to, to pull that anchor back in. And uh, I've got Two-Tone Murphy here beside me in this picture. And in later pictures, I've got my dog with me. So, you know, I thought I'd take him for a spin. He took me for a spin the other day when he was on stream. So let's do that. Um, anyway, this is very unique how they've made this work with the anchor and it does hold you there. And it's good for your run up too, you guys. Now, in real life, the run-up would run into that anchor line. Hmm. So I would think they would have some type of attach point at the back for when you're doing the run-up. Because the run-up's going to make you go forward. I don't know. That just seems kind of nuts. But you can do it here in the sim. That anchor will hold you there while you're doing your run-up. So that's good. Here's the, uh, the wingtip floats. And there's the float lever. You have to grab it and hold it and push it with your mouse. It's not just a clickable, you guys. And they go back up in here. You can see where they, they retract and lock into place here while you're flying or while you're landing on land. And you still see the nav light will still show up. Cool. The flaps you can see back here also, they're split flaps, just like back in the day. And a lot of the warplanes we've looked at, same thing. Spitfires like that, Wildcats like that. Um, Spruce Goose, I think. You know, we go back to all of them. It's like, this seems to be very common back in the day, the split flap idea. And uh, I think I said 108, I was guessing, but it's 105 knots. We use these. We bring them down when you're low enough. If you're gonna land on water, right? Reverse prop for dock management, yes. And you can see there's the water rubber. So reverse prop is right here, you guys. Now I did ask the question, and, and this is where I first heard from Mario in an email. He replied to me saying, you can map, you can make a mapping to reverse propeller, right? But. Uh, and then Andrew reminded me, and, and so did Mario in a second email, Andrew reminded me that there's this beautiful lever right here. And boom, we got it. So you can use it in a short field landing, which I've tried. It's mainly for water operations. It's mainly, you know, when the wind is pushing you against the dock and you just can't get away from the dock. Or mainly when you're into a dock straight and there's no other way out. There's no way to turn around and come back out again. All right, unless someone pushes it around like you do with a boat, right? Um, you can just back out as long as there's nobody in front of you. So remember, when you're using the reverse prop, make sure there's nobody in front of you in real life, right? You just blow them away or blow them off the dock. <laughs> You'll notice if you watch dock operations, 
people clear the dock before a plane departs or even comes back. There's one person there ready to grab a line and he's ready to hold on in case he gets a blast, right? All right, and here I am, reverse prompt for dock management. I docked into a hard dock right here and I just simply backed away when I was ready. So I pulled into here until you're almost ready to bump it or you could bump it, I guess, in the sim and then throw your anchor, which is the equivalent of tying up. All right, and that'll keep you there the whole time. I'll do that exact thing, all right? Now I'm saying um, unless it's a low floating dock, it's best to anchor out and be brought to shore by boat, which I see a lot of black and white pictures of the day. They would do that. Um, and the main reason is, and you can see here, I do have the floats on because you are in the water. If you don't have the floats lowered, your plane will tilt. There's no doubt, yep. there's no stability there. You just go, er, you got a wing in the water, right? So you got to have those floats on while you're in the water. Now you get close to the dock. I had to park like this instead of alongside the dock because the float hits the dock. Probably wreck it, all right? So I found that straight in was the only way, which is kind of crazy to try and get out of it. So, you know, it would have been interesting to see people getting in and out of this thing. Um, and I see typically they're just anchored out from a dock and they just, they have a, a tender. They have a small boat that comes out and gets them. Or they have a, you know how it is, you guys, you could put your small boat attached to that anchor out there in the water. And then you come in and attach to it and then take your small boat and go ashore. That's how we typically would do it. Take it for a spin. So try stalls to get used to how it feels and how it works. Uh, we're going to do that. We're going to take off from an airport first. We're going to try some spins and stalls. And then we're going to come and do a water landing. And from the water landing, we'll go back over and do a docking. All right, that's what we're going to do. Circuits, circuits, and more circuits. And use your checklists. All right, so I'm going to use the POH. I'm going to bring it up on the screen. I take off on land, cruise to the practice area, do a stop and go and then head to, to a long lake. And I'm suggesting a long lake or even a coastline, you guys. When you're doing water landings for the first time, take your time. You see the trees coming, you want to put it down, look out. You know, so you want to make sure that um, you've got lots of room ahead of you when you're first learning to fly float planes. And this is what I learned when I learned to fly float planes is that you don't just go into a lake and go, I know what I'm doing. It tells me I can land in 1200 feet. In water, you'll coast a lot too. And we want to get down gently and it'll take a while. We'll be floating still. We might even be 20 feet off the water. We're still trying to put it down gently. We might eat up a lot of that lake. So until you can plop it down where you want it gently, you got to give yourself a lot of space. All right. Or you're going to run into some trees and you're going to have no fun at all. This is supposed to be for adventures, not for stress, right? How are you doing? First time chat, welcome to the stream. I'm Howard of Ford to Learn to Fly, and this is Andrew over here on my left, your right. And he's Hello. on the water. Who is that? That's uh, Dr. Notham following you, Andrew. Um, Look behind you. Where he, I'm not sure where he went. He was there. Oh, yeah, there he is. Yeah, he's behind you. Yeah, he's on your tail. The two of them are off on an adventure, you guys. Is that cool or what? That is cool. And that water spray you're seeing now, it's a bit pixelated from Dr. Notham's screen, but that water spray is a beautiful mist coming back there. And one of the reasons I, I talk about that, you guys, gorgeous, gorgeous views. One of the reasons I talk about it is it's important with a pusher prop. Um, it doesn't act the same way as, if you want to call them polar props, conventional props out front. Out front, they might not even feel the spray because the spray is way back there. All right, but a pusher prop is further back and you're already getting some spray from the hull. And it's going to turn that into a fine mist right away. And we get that here in the sim. It's actually pretty cool. And uh, so it's modeled really well. I like how that's done. And some of you won't care about the mist. It's like, we don't care. I get it, right? That part isn't as important. All right, these guys are having fun in the water. Look at that turn radius. He must have his water rudder down, yeah. And then we'll look over at Andrew now and just see how he's doing. Get a side view, Andrew, and maybe we'll see um, that mist in action. You're just doing a slow taxi. Now, you can fast taxi with this, you guys. Remember, the water rudder can take it all the way up to 45. And you know you're not going to fly at 45. So you can do, you know, get up on the step at 30, uh, 35 maybe to 45. You're up on the step already. And then you, up up goes your, you know, the rudder's already yeah, out of the water the, at that point. Uh, the spray starts to show up around 8. 
Around eight, okay. Yeah. Cool. Nice. All right, so let's go take a look, you guys, at my airplane. Oh, it's a beauty. Did that just take your breath away, you guys? It just took my breath away. And so I'm not saying that because Mary was in chat. I would have said that anyway. <laughs> this is what, what I love a plane. I love a plane. So, you know, when you take a look at this thing, how unique that is with that prop behind. And uh, I've seen a few kit planes that are like that. But what's unique about this plane, oh, there's lots of things unique. What's unique is that the front, you're going to see where the air comes in and it looks just like, and I, I want to say, I want to say an Avro something, Andrew, that has air intake on the leading edge. And uh, I want you guys to, I want to introduce you guys to Kayla. Kayla is my husky from years ago. And uh, and uh, I don't know who that guy is with the mustache, but you know, let's take it for a spin. Oh, hi. <laughs> he looked over. Oops. <laughs> yeah, can we go for a fly now? <laughs> the Riviera, you guys, that's what it was called. It's an easier name to remember than all the other letters. Look how beautifully it's modeled, you guys. That's a nice shine. Somebody shined it all up for us for today. Yes, sirree. And uh, so anyway, let's just take a look at the rudder at the back. There it is. And if I put power on right now, and then I hit the rudder, I just go back inside. Here's the water rudder right here. We're up on wheels, we can do this. No, we can't, the engine's not running. <laughs> we'll get the engine running first, look. There's no indicator, even though there's power. Of course, I'm so used to electrics. Uh, you gotta have hydraulics, you guys, for these things. All right, so let's go through the checklist stuff. Let's just bear with me as we go through. You know, we gotta get it running. Now you can use the built-in checklist right here, of course. And everything is there. It's all there. There's nothing else needed. And so here's before starting the engine. Normal takeoff, water takeoff. Cool, right? I'm going to be doing a normal takeoff. And you can see here, landing gear down. Well, of course. Floaters up. Well, of course. And parking brake on. So, you know, it's really an elaboration. The fact that we have floaters now, it's an elaboration of what we're, what we're used to in other planes. If you take a look at this, you can see our floaters are up. And it looks very much like the Navion B when it does that, right? Remember the Navion B? And I think the Comanche 250 had tip tanks too, right? But they were for fuel, right? Yeah. When they talk about auxiliary tanks here, you guys, there's there's four compartments. The two main ones are right here, right close to the fuselage. Good for weight and balance. And then there's two more. The auxiliaries are out here, right? So, beautiful. Um, so these are really floaters. That's what they're for. And they have the shape of a boat right on the bottom of them. That'll be the bottom when it swings down. Beautiful. All right. And so external power we're not using. We're battery off for external power, but we are going to be using the built-in power for it. So the standard stuff, if you think about it, is very much like um, any other startup. You guys, we put our battery switch on, our generator switch on, make sure all breakers are pushed in, landing lights, test, test, fuel selector left. So let's just go through that and just, I'll use this for now. I was going to use the scrolling one, but why not? This one stays there when, no matter what we do. All right. So we go in to the bottom here, get rid of that for the moment so we can see things better. I like to actually just not use my head tracker because it kind of moves around. I'll just give you an idea. It's not that bad. Doesn't, is I've, I've fine tuned it, but it's still a bit jittery. Okay. So I'm just going to use no head tracker. And you can see here, here's our switches here, along here. Circuit breakers along here. There's a couple more circuit breakers further over. Right here, somewhere. Right there, there they are. Because <laughs> during my downwind check, you run your thumb across here, circuit breakers are all in, and these circuit breakers are all in. You'll and see be this very one. careful, and be very careful when you're pretend checking your circuit breakers, because they work. They work, click, click, yep, there we go. Panel floodlight, panel floodlight for red or white. My trim indicator is at zero. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself here. So float indicator lights test. So there's two tests here, landing gear indicator, floater indicator. All right, let's move that over to, bear with me guys. The first few times here are things we don't know. So here we see gear is down in green. Okay, that's good. Water we're not using at all, so there's no lights on there. And you can see green here too. So those don't even need to be tests, but you can click them. And you can see that the float testing light right there. Yep, so the light does work. And you would have done the same thing here if it weren't already on for us. All right, because we've got, the, we've got the battery switch on right now. So battery switch is on, it's right here. And then right beside it is generator. 
it's now on also. Although I don't usually put generator on until after I start the engine, but that's the test here. All right, fuel selector on left. Now in this plane, it's up top. I think there's a, a view for that. There we go. And that was control five. Control five is doing that. I'm gonna just move the visor out of the way here. And you can see here it's in the off position or it should be. And it has us go to the left tank first, whichever way gets us there. Now, when you come in to land, you guys, you're going to put it on the fullest tank. If I've been using left for this demo, I should be switching that to right to come in to land. Fullest tank, right? Outside air temperature is a balmy 17 degrees. We're good. Better than what it is right now. Um, I was outside building a fence and painting today, so I'm so glad to be inside flying. This is the way to go. All right. Let's go take a look at our checklist. Radio's off, and the radios are off. Uh, I don't have this thing off. But then again, I don't want that right now. I'm just gonna go back to this. And you can turn the radios off, you guys, the way you normally would the, right here. Yeah, the GPS doesn't turn off. Probably not, so I'm just gonna do the normal. Radios are off, there we yeah, go. It's the just radios the flying do, control. But the, yeah, the radios do, but the GPS doesn't. And neither does the autopilot. I don't see an off switch here anywhere. So but that's it doesn't, all right. it, doesn't have a, it doesn't have an off switch even in and one of the reasons you guys that they want your radios off is because when you first start an engine there could be a surge of electricity as the regulator figures it out right even if it's a split second you could have a, a zap to your electronics and so this is why we always protect them on startup and leave them off that's why flight control is free here we go I'm going to show you this view because, uh, you know, it's, it's easier than trying to look around your shoulder. And this view here, we can just do a quick check. I like to use the one, two, three, four, five, six check, which means I'm going to do it here like this, which means I'm going to go one, two, looking at this aileron. And when I say one, I'm actually turning the yoke to the left and the left aileron should be up. Always you look over at the aileron and you go up and down. There's one, two. Right now I'm looking over at the other aileron to the right, and I'm going up, down. All right, and that makes that sure that the linkage is okay. And then now I'm going, so that was three, four, five, six on the elevator, seven, eight. All right, there's our eight checks on our controls free. Now you'll notice a lot of people, if they have a stick, they'll just go like this, and they're like, a, you know, they're mixing a brew, and that'll see all the controls move, and you're fine, right? All right, now we could just tick all the items. I'm not going to tick them, but we'll just go like this. It's easy enough, though. You could just tick at each item as we go along. Um, magneto both. All right, so I'm going to turn my magneto on, which is right behind my checklist. Let's move that back over up in the corner out of the way. All right, and you can see in here as you look down, where's the magneto? Right here. The normal key switch with the, the green tag on it. There must be some significance there, Mario, to the green tag. Tell me about that. And there's a starter switch right beside it, you guys. So here we're going to put the magnetos on both. Right, left, both. Get ready to roll. Now let's just take a look at your levers. Mixture, propeller, and throttle. So mixture and propeller. Let's just make sure. Mixture is all the way in. Propeller is all the way in. Throttle is all the way back and then cracked a quarter. All right, we're going to take that up to 1,000 and let it warm up. Okay. Fuel pump is low. Starter cover open and then starter on. So fuel pump low. Don't turn it on till you're ready to start. There's a caution in the POH. If you turn this on with your mixture rich and leave it, you'll end up filling about, I forget how much, um, it wasn't a full liter of fuel ready to go and you can flood the engine. So you only flip that, boom. You can hear the hum, prop clear. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. The first thing you look for is oil pressure and temperature, you guys. I mean, not temperature, oil pressure. Coming over here, I want to be somewhere around 1200 RPM or, or 1000 or so. I think 1000 to warm up, I think the POH says. So let me pull that throttle back a bit. I had it cracked too much. There's about 1000. So I'm just looking at RPM right now. And that's controlled at this point at low RPMs, it's controlled by your throttle because your, your blue lever's all the way in. That's the part that confuses people. Once you're in cruise, your blue lever controls it in this range. All right, so now we just wanna look here and just make sure. And you can see in here, I've got lots of fuel. 
My amperage is good. I could put a load on it during my testing. Oil temperature is rising into the green. It's not in the red below here. If it were below the red, we stop within 30 seconds. Good. Oil pressure on, uh, sorry, oil pressure is here. Sorry, this is oil temperature. Temperature is rising into green. Oil pressure, if it's in the red when we start, we, we, we cut the engine completely. And then cylinder head temperature is rising up too. And they should all end up in the green as we go along. During our downwind check, we're gonna be checking that. We're gonna leave our low um, fuel pump on until we take off and we're gonna turn it off after we retract our flaps and stuff, just so you know. Okay, let's go back to a normal view here like that. Everything's looking good and we're sitting at a thousand so that we can warm up everything. And then we will do a quick run up into wind, you guys. Euro Eurovia is a student association for aerospace students. Huh. That's your key tag. Wow, cool. See, there's always a story, right? Ah, that's cool. <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? Now, it does say confirm, stabilize, and then turn the fuel pump off, but it does tell us to turn it on for takeoff. Okay, so we'll turn it off for now. It tells us to turn it back on for takeoff. And here's our normal three to four PSI. Usually it's up to five. Mm. It is pressure, hey. right? Pressure, yep, PSI. Hey, Fox. Flux is in the house. Hey, go fuel pump off. Flaps check. All right, so flaps check. I can see it right here, right at the bottom of the screen. Again, let's just go in a little further. Boop, boop, boop. And we just see here, completely in the up position. Just so you can see that in action. They would have been down for the outside external check. There's two, there's three, there's four. Four pushes of the flap lever. All right, and that would be my max for takeoff. Typically takeoff in 15 or 10, All right? I'm going to leave it at 10. It's where it's going to be for takeoff anyway. And the pusher prop is behind us. It's not pushing air at that. All right. At some point, we're going to be setting all our switches, but let's just wait for it. Warm up. RPM 1,000 to 1,200. We're good. Oil temperature greater than 86 Fahrenheit. Cylinder head greater than 302 and oil pressure less than 60. Okay, then. Let's just check it out and see how we're doing. RPMs at 1,000 or 1,050 way up there and then we're taking a look here at our oil temperature still can't read it it's so tiny but you know when you glance over during your downward check you're seeing that it's in the green and that's what's important this one's not quite up to the green yet but it's not in trouble all right this is our oil pressure they're saying pressure should be less than 60 60s right here so they're not saying greater than anything you obviously don't want it down here where it's red it's good and during cruise, you'll see it move up into here, right? And cylinder head temperature, I think they said, uh, it was right there in front of me, 302. All right, and we're at 200, 300, we're at 302. <laughs> so it's like, well, we could be at 310. There's 400, okay. But again, it's in the green, we're good. And this is really what it's all about, you guys. Is it in the green? We're good. Let's stay in here in case we have to go in a little closer. All right, bear with me before taxi. We're doing a normal takeoff. Not a water takeoff. Let's just check this out. Parking brake off. Ooh, that's it? Is that it? Is that all there is? Um, hey, we also got some other gauges here, you guys, that aren't really mentioned, but you know, this is very handy. This one, the Davtron. Outside air temperature, um, OAT in Fahrenheit, OAT in Celsius, uh, pressure altitude, density altitude, and voltage. These are so handy. All right, the different display modes. There's Fahrenheit, Celsius, there is uh, density altitude zero is good to here. And then your voltage 26.3. I think it's a 27 volt system. Should be generating, but uh, I'm not worried. Unless there's lights flashing somewhere, we're good. All right, parking brake off and away we go. Let's go taxi and take off. Brakes test. Let's do an engine run up. So what we're gonna do is just go over and just do a quick run up. You guys know how this is done. It was my original tag before I was tagged with firewall. Let's have a quick look where we are. At whatever airport we're at, I'm not gonna tell you yet. I'm not gonna tell you yet. No, it's gonna tell you right on the screen. So here I am and I wanna go one of these. I'm gonna take off at this one up here where somebody's already moving. All right, so I'm gonna do a 270 and then head out there. 270 to my left. Oh. Can't go to my left. Okay, I'm gonna go 270 to my right. There we go. Let's leave that up for a second and the checklist. Controls are all free. We're good. Take it back to idle. I wanna do a, a run up first, but uh, let me just find out where the wind is, you guys. 
and uh, probably the easiest way is just to go to go into here and just see where the wind is. 270 at one knot. So it doesn't really matter where we do the run up. I'm going to do it right here. So um, at one knot, you normally turn into wind. We're in. We're close enough. Look at this funny looking thing here. Uh huh. I think there's a switch for that, Andrew. The turn coordinator. If I remember correctly. Let's have a quick look here. I think there's an actual switch for the turn coordinator right here. Fourth, fourth one from the right. Fourth from the right, right here, you guys. Boom. Look at that. It's electric driven. You notice the the wing was low? <laughs> yeah, that was interesting. All right, so I'm not going to use this yet because uh, we got to do the run up. All right, so rudder neutral. And the rudder is neutral. I've got my feet off the rudder. Parking brake is on. If it weren't on, we'd be moving right now. And uh, RPM adjust to 17. Here we go. And the first thing to look at, and I made this mistake without the parking brake once, as you take this up to 17. Sorry, I'm down at idle now. You shouldn't want to leave it at idle. Take it up to 17. If you're moving, be looking out the window while you're doing this. There's 17 right there. Bang on. Boom. Got it. And we're going to look closely at that while we move the magneto around. For those who haven't seen this before, you'll be using the key here. See the key? It says magneto on it. You're going to change it over to right and wait and watch the drop. There should be probably a 50 RPM drop. And what you're doing is you're testing the magneto spark generation circuit. You're testing the spark plug, one of the two spark plugs in each cylinder. All right. And you're testing the whole circuit to make sure it's working. You'll see a drop in RPM because one of them isn't sparking it. You know, it's not doing anything. And you're going to see go back to both so that the plug doesn't get fouled. Now you're sparking both plugs and both plugs will now clean up any sludge or any kind of carbon or any kind of build up, any kind of anything. It'll just clean it up. And so now you're going to go to left and do the left spark plug and do that. Now, the right plug could be getting fouled while you're doing that because it's not sparking. So you go back to both and that fires both of them again and cleans everything up. That's why you do it. And you're doing it under stress, as they say. We're not going much higher than that. We'll start blowing buildings around and f people around. And so you, you take it up to some kind of stress level. All right, let's give that a shot. I'm going to just use my alpha for this. So you watch down here as it turns. I'm going over to the right one first, which is far over. It's on the right one. My RPM dropped from 17. If I had to zoom right in there, it's probably 50 RPM. These are 100 increments. One, two, three, four, five. So one and a half. So I went from 17 to 1650. I dropped 50, which is great. All right, don't leave it there too long. Put it back on both. It should rise back up as it clears the foul, the fouled plug. It'll cl climb back up. I missed radios on. I don't want radios yet, but thanks for that, Brad. It's like, you know, when you watch somebody painting, I was painting a fence today after I built it. It's like somebody comes over and says, um, you missed a spot. <laughs> you're right, missing a checklist item could be life and death. I don't need radios yet, but you're right. I'll, I'll tune them in a minute. I'm doing the run up here. Now, if I had to taxi to do the run up, I would need the radios to request taxi. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not taxiing anywhere yet, but so I'm okay. It's not unsafe, but I'll turn them on in a minute. And I'll turn them on to test the ammeter, which is right here. Make sure that it doesn't give it a big load. All right, so we're back to 17. Now we go over to left. We should see the same sort of drop. If not, then there's something wrong. And there's about a 50 RPM drop right there. Looking good. And no more than 150 between them, which is like a lot of engines, right? All right, all right. Let's see. Um, so ammeter check, magnetos check, propeller check. I mean, propeller check. What are we checking for the propeller? <laughs> I'll show you what we mean by that. <laughs> you got, I want I want my passenger to go out and check the propeller right now. It's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> I was just kidding. Uh, all right, so now I'm going to turn the radios on. As soon as I turn this, we should see something happen here. If not, it means it's well regulated. Boom. Not even a twitch. So that's fine. Radios, especially transmitting radios, do pull a lot of power. I'm going to turn on the second one. No variance right here, so I'm, I'm glad. That means it's well regulated, we're good. Turn up the volume, turn up the volume. The hardest thing is a mouse inside the cockpit, isn't it? Okay, we're good to go. Um, and then uh, turn your transponder to standby. That keeps it warm. That's the idea, you guys, keeps it warm. 
you don't turn it on and alt unless your unless your radio tells you to or unless you're ready for takeoff and you turn it to alt 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 okay so um let's see what we got going here cylinder head temperature in the green so now we're, we're at 1700 we're making sure everything's in the green and we're checking things i did the magnetos check the ammeter check i've basically checked i don't have any other electrics here that i can really drag it down to see if the needle moves um throttle to idle and then parking brake off all right so i'll pick i'll take it back to idle in a second here um we've got the radios on what else do we need here i see that suction is there i'm just going to take a quick look now still in the green for temperature which is good at 1700 oil pressure is now in the green cylinder head temperature is still in the high end of the green heading towards 400 and we're just making sure they're in the green you guys green 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 check 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 so for the propeller check what's typically done you guys for the propeller check what you typically do is move your propeller lever see that as i pull it back Pulling it back up again, don't leave it down there. And what you're doing is you're pumping it. If, it. if I went into the POH, it's probably telling me to do this three times or two times. Believe it or not, when you hear engines doing this, you know somebody is warming up the oil in the governor. In other words, at that very hub of the propeller where it actually changes the blades, that's the oil that needs to be warmed up. You're letting some oil out, the blades are turning, you're letting some oil in, the blades are actually getting thinner again, and you're actually checking your blue lever is what I'm doing in and out. It is what it is. Yeah. It's playing right now, Andrew. It is what it is. <laughs> well, Andrew's flying around. All right, I've got that thing warmed up beautifully. Everything else is good. Back to idle. I just pull my throttle back and just see what happens. And while you're on the ground, you're seeing what happens. If the engine conks out here, we're in trouble. But as I learned by mistake, as I learned in a past lesson, you guys, leaving it here, a lot of airplanes will not be charging anything. And look at my amps. Oops. So let's just see at what point the generator or alternator kicks in. Oh, right there. All right, hold on. Let me come back to about 600. Yeah, it's right there. It's directly proportional. You really want that thing up there. Yep. So when you're taxiing, it's fine to be at neutral or sort of fine to be at idle. When you're coming into land, it's fine to be at idle. But any other time you should be up there at some at some number above a thousand to keep your keep things being charged. Beautiful. All right, circuit breakers are all in temperature and pressures in the green. We're good. Let's go before takeoff. Well, I'm going to taxi first, right? So I'm going to set the elevator trim for takeoff fuel pump on low. So I'm going to turn that on when I'm at the hold short, you guys. I'm going to do transponder. I'm going to do time transponder talk. And in this case, I'm adding fuel. Right? So I'm going to do four things, but the three T's typically, and then I'm adding a fourth one for, for, for the actual. And then you're doing one last check of everything. Flap set for takeoff, propeller full forward, right? Because you've been playing with the propeller lever. All right, time to taxi. I said I'd do a 270 to the right. Yeah, if I remember correctly. Parking brake is off. We're moving. And I'm going to pull back power right away because because it really wants to taxi you guys. It's a fast taxi machine. And there's a, there's a, better do this so I can see what's going on. Yep, I cleared him. Now you'd normally get taxi clearance. This is an uncontrolled airport. So I just report that I'm taxiing, right? I'm not worried about radio calls as you know. During the lesson, we're focusing on the airplane, you guys. We like to fly out of an airport where there isn't much activity and we don't have to worry about the busyness of the airspace. Look at this thing. Isn't it cute? I like it. I want one for Christmas. Wait a minute. I already have one. I'm good. Simba Flyer's in the area. He found us, Andrew. He found us. <laughs> Kayla and I are going for an adventure. Where shall we go? I'm going to fly out of runway 15. <laughs> Cub's still at it? Dr. No Thumb, it was so nice of you to be here. I'm glad we got a couple of your videos. I didn't know how long you'd be here. We got a couple of your clips as you went along. It was great. Beside me, uh, my, my Husky. My Husky, you guys. Our Husky actually helped, helped us train other dogs to be more balanced.
I just got showing you guys the view from in here. So, um, hey, there's another one right there. They're all over the place. Clearance to take off. Let's do the five T's, time, transponder, and talk. It does actually have a clock here, which is great. And then um, we also want to turn on the transponder to alt. Bloom, bloom, right there. And, uh, and then we also said we want to put fuel on low, remember? Boom, and it gives us extra fuel pressure just to make sure we always have fuel on takeoff. In fact, one of the Nardis that one of the accidents of the Nardis that I was reading about in the accident analysis, um, he had turned his tank to an empty tank to take off. And he took off and it had some in the fuel bowl, as a lot of you may know. There is some fuel in the fuel bowl up at the engine. And he was about 200 feet off the ground when all of a sudden no fuel in the engine died. 200 feet off the ground, you can only land straight ahead. Well, it took him by surprise and he nosed in. And there, there goes another Nardi. But you know, the point was that that you always turn to your fullest tank and you check the quantity. I've got it set for left tank right now and my left is full, but up my right is also full, so I'm good. You notice that idle here, I'm not charging. Look at that, Woo, my M meter. All right, let's rock and roll. Now, if you wanna set anything while you're on the ground, you would do it here. If I were to set, say, 2000 feet and um, Maybe, you know, just use VS, maybe a nice comfortable 500, and then use my heading indicator, a heading bug over here, whatever it's set for right now, it's set for north. Um, but probably, you know, I'm so used to the heading bugs in a G1000, you just push the button and they go straight ahead, right? Well, let's push this one back somewhere where we are now. And we'll head out in that direction. All right, we got everything set. If we're not off the ground by halfway down the runway, we're going to abort, that's the plan. And I'm sticking to it. All right, away we go. Let's see if we've missed anything here. Doors are closed and locked? Of course. If you didn't know. Well, that's the autopilot. If you didn't know, you guys, you can open the doors. And if you're sitting here waiting for clearance, you might do that. There's no propeller out front pushing that door shut. Isn't that cool? And we have no forward motion. Look at that. Is that cool? And that, in a hot summer, is probably what they did. Close the door, make sure it's latched. Same with the other side, we're good. Where's my puppy? And that seatbelt should be latched. For security reasons, you guys, that should never be loose like that. Always latch them when there's nobody there. All right, rock and roll, let's get going. Parking brake is not off. Parking brake is off. Beautiful. The mirror says check your trim because the AP moved it. Oh, AP moved the trim, really? Ooh. Oh, look. Yes, absolutely. Look at that. That just drives me nuts. That just drives me nuts. I'm about to take off. Nice catch. Let's go down, 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 down. Why would it do that on the ground? Hey, Whiskey Canuck. Who gave me that tip? Mario. Mario, thanks for that, man. Thanks for that. And you can tell just by glancing, you guys, it's at zero right there. Now, it's supposed to be at, at neutral, as they say, for a single pilot. But I do have a dog in the plane with me. I'm going to say 60 pounds, maybe 70 pounds. So it says 10 degrees after that. So I'll just go over to 10. Or you could even, you know, interpolate and say, OK, I'll do five degrees, something like that. But that's it. But, you know, once you get into that range, you want to just have a quick look. There's six. Okay. Take it back to five. Four, five. There's five. All right. And that should give you a normal takeoff. Even at a couple of degrees difference, you can still pull it off. All right. Gears down. Floats are up. Flaps are where they should be. How do we know? Let's do a quick check. Right here. Flaps are at 10. That's what I wanted. And away we go. Time transponder talk is done. Everything's done. Is there anybody on the inbound? No. Anybody on the runway? No. We're good to go. And as there's nobody around right now, I'm gonna stop on the runway for a second. I'm just gonna get ahead of the plane and see what should I be doing once I take off? Hold it there. So we're just gonna go here and say, take off, what does it expect us to do? Normal takeoff. Release the brakes, full open at 65 knots, we're rotating positive rate of climb. This is important, you guys. If you're in a high altitude and you're not getting a positive rate of climb, uh-oh. All right, landing gear up, 
at 85 knots, flaps up, fuel pump off. So I always just do flaps up, fuel pump off, because they're both right there down below there on the right. All right, and away we go. All right, let's leave that open as a reminder. We're looking for 65 over here, right here. <laughs> Where am I looking? 65, and just to show you what that looks like, it's starting the white arc, and it's the first notch in. Right around there is rotate time. Now in the water, we have to look for 45, but we'll talk about water in a minute. We're gonna go land in the water. All right, full power, nice and gradual. Treat your engine with respect. We're rolling. Airspeed's alive. Our altitude here is 500 feet by the looks of it. All right, we're coming up on 40. Everything's good to go. We're at 65, time to rotate. Beautiful, nice and smooth. Looking great. With one knot of wind, we shouldn't be drifting anywhere. Have a look. Ooh, beautiful. Gear up. No more usable runway. 85 knots, which I've already... I'm at that right now. 85 knots. Flaps up. One notch. Two notches. Three notches. I should be good. Have a quick look. Yep. Straight up. Nice. Seattle Center, Nardi Charlie, Foxtrot, oh. Lima, Tango, Fox. My Husky is calling Nardi, the tower. Vieira, one mile south of Sierra, <laughs> request flight following then, will you, Kayla? Request flight following. Oh, way to go. He pressed a quite flight following. Uh, uh, last thing on the checklist, you guys, fuel pump off. Uh, boosh. There we go. Squawk Rock and roll. Seven, one, Nardi, Lima, Tango, Fox, we are flying. Nardi, Lima, Tango, Fox, Trot, radar contact. Give me a transponder code. Good. Standard pressure. We're good. Roger Nardi, Lima, Tango, Foxtrot. And I would have already got ADIS ahead of time. All right. Now that we're... So I'm going to stay around here just for sightseeing. You guys might even know where we are now. And now I'm going to pull back into the green. Into the green, you guys, into the green. Now, who can tell me, should I pull back the throttle first or the propeller first? Let me keep it at 24 and 24.50. There we go. There's our normal cruise at 2,500. Let's see what we get out of this thing. And we're going to okay, level it off at 2,000. It's outside in when you're slowing down and inside out when you're speeding up. Cool, Andrew. You remember that. Oh. Cool. So prop, so slowing down, prop, then throttle, speeding up, throttle, then prop. All right, so let's put it back to normal here that we were on takeoff. There it was. Everything's full forward. All right, so you're saying for slowing down now, outside in, right? So outside meaning blue lever's way on the outside. Yep. And so blue lever first, pull that back to my 24 area. And then now my throttle, pull that back to 24.50 or so. And you notice fuel pressure in here lessens as we go along. Where are we anyway? Where are we, Andrew? What area of the world are we in? And we should be cleaned up and ready to roll, you guys. Nice and clean, no flaps. Nice and clean, nothing hanging out anywhere. Rocking and rolling. Kayla and I are out exploring. You guys look familiar? Saturday group fly, huh? Let me turn that down a bit for you. Or is that coming through? It looks like it's coming through here. There we go. Oops, pay attention. Now, just to show you that autopilot does work, we'll look at there's Andrew in flight. Oops. You know, they, they said they said we were doing flight following. They gave us a transponder code here, and they didn't tell us there's traffic in sight. <laughs> uh, traffic is on your 12 o'clock. Ah, it looks like you're... 1,500 feet? Yeah. All right. Yeah. No conflict. We're good. I'm flying way too high. All right. So I'm going to just bring it back some more. And we're good. Now, let's go land on water. Next is there's a, a seaplane base right over here off my left wing, you guys. Let's just see how that goes. All right. And then on the way back to the airport, we're going to just put autopilot on so you can see it in action. We are getting our 141 at 24. Oh, we're less than 24 here. We're still getting 141. Nice. And now I'm going to trim that so we don't go any higher. 2,500 is plenty. So now to think about the approach over there, I'm going to head over there. It's around the same altitude. It's probably ocean water. Maybe not, but it's still going to be close around the zero to 500 feet for altitude. 
And uh, these are the Juice Goose sand dunes, you guys. This is the Juice Bowl area. That's where we are. And we might even spot a couple of Juice Gooses on the ground, as I did yesterday when I was doing test flights. It was like there was three or four of them, and I even recorded one of them going over it bridge so if anybody else wants to come in with their juice goose to the goose bowl come on down we'll probably be where we end up we'll be able to watch you do some of the jumps over the big bridge all right let's get out the checklist again and let's go look at landing on water Ooh, let's go there uh let's see before takeoff en route cruise descent and descent just says mixture lever full rich which i never did change because i wasn't above 3000 throttle just decrease the throttle Anyway, before landing, floats down for water. Remember, below 105, we put the floats down. Water landing, let's have a look. Mixture levers full rich. Fuel selectors on the fullest tank. Guys, I got two full tanks. I'm leaving it where it is. It's on the left tank. We're going to keep it there. It's fine. Uh, on a, after a journey, of course, it would have drained one of them. Uh, fuel selector, airspeed reduced below 108. All right, so even now, I'm going to turn where I'm going to be heading, but I'm, I'm going to be he getting there soon. So I'm going to just descend really quickly here. Full forward on my blue lever and then pull my throttle back. And it sees right away, it says, you don't have any gear, so you must need floats. All right, I'm at 110 and I'm descending. I'm going to pull down to idle now. And I'm at 105, there we go, 105. Down come the floats. Remember that? Gear and floats can happen at the same time here at this speed. Do I want gear? No, no gear. And uh, floats are down. I didn't show the animation, but it was awesome. And now we're going to be going over that away. Somewhere over there. Oh, way over there. I've actually gone further than I want to. There's an area further back. Let me just go find it. Um, let me go find it while we have a quick look at where Andrew is. Where are you, Andrew? Are you near me? You were headed back to the airport last time I saw you. I'm uh, just flying over the one of uh, the southern end of the runway. The, oh, the good, runway you're back there already. Soon. Okay, we'll be heading there soon. All right, I'm going to do this because I'm doing a left turn. It's easier to do it this way. I'm going to be going further up. I think where we want to go. Yeah, I was really moving along, you guys, at 140 knots. I really want to go up. Towards where Andrew and Srap are, but there's this lake right there in front of us. There's an actual seaplane base there. We were there for the group fly on Saturday. I'm sort of leveling off around here just to get there. There's a few trees there that are probably at a thousand feet. So I'm just going to keep it like this. I've got floats down, but no flaps yet. Not yet. I am in the flap range. I'm going to keep it like this for now. Maybe bring it up just a little bit. All right, let's have a look and make sure we know. Airspeed below 108, landing gear up is up. Floaters down. Config light says water. Yep, and we're in the water area, you guys, look. Water, water, look, red, 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 we're good. You're coming into an airport, you don't wanna see red. Uh, fuel pump on low, here we go. Put it back on low, just as a safety feature. You don't need it, but we're gonna do it. Um, airspeed 80 to 90 on approach. All right, let's get it lower now. Propeller full forward flaps for landing. All right, so we're in the flap range as you can see right here. So we're gonna start dropping flaps now. One, watch the indicator down here. Two, three, adjust your trim. And I'm pulling back some power. I'm coming in to land in this area right here before that island. That's the actual runway right there in the water. That's where I'm coming. All right, speed's coming down. We're now at 90. We want to be between 80 and 90 and we're there already with those amount of flaps but we do want a water landing which is even more flaps we'll just have to mind our speed get the nose down take it easy take it easy and once we get in the water and we're below 45 knots we can drop the rudder i've got flaps going galore and i'm pushing the yoke like mad so i better trim that and i'm pulling back power again Let's just judge that, see how it goes. We don't want to skim the trees. We want to be able, we got lots of lake ahead of us. And there is a buffer zone up ahead that we can go off to the left a bit. And you'll see there's a bit of a runway there we can use. Okay, I'm below 80, so I'm giving it some power. Pulling up a little bit. 
It's all about power now, you guys. You set your speed and then you adjust power to get there. Or take power away if you're going to overshoot it. Are we all set for landing? Everything's ready. We're good. Here's the runway configuration. Past this point here, sort of in line with the point. All right, now I've cleared the trees. Pulling back some power again. 80 knots, good. As I start to see the ripples on the water, I'm going to turn towards where the runway faces. And I'm going to just watch my speed. This is hard when the water's so glassy, you guys. It, you could easily bump the water. I see some ripples. Take your time. Make sure it's nice and gentle. Take your time. And I did touch. Little bounce. Take your time. There we go. Beautiful. A little bit of a bounce there. It's hard to do on glassy water. All right, I'm cutting power completely. I'm definitely low enough to use the rudder. On goes the rudder. And now as I get down towards a nice manageable range, I'm going to now turn. Now, if I were to show you that, I wasn't looking at Little Lamb Map, but I wanted to just show you if it was realistic. Let's have a quick look here. It should be an island right there. There it is. We were here on Saturday, you guys. For a group fly, it was a lot of fun. I'm going to head back toward the shore. And the base is over there somewhere. Now I'm heading back. I'm backtracking on it until someone's in coming in for landing and then I'll get out of the way. So now we've got the water rudder down. Let's pick it up a bit. Don't go above 45. I'll come back to the checklist in a minute. I see another one up ahead. Take a look at a fast taxi here. Whoops. There's a fast taxi going on. Look up on the step and that, you know, when you're on the step, it means that the back part is not in the water. There's less friction. The most amount of friction is right there in the middle. And this is a fast taxi. You can do that. It's certainly smoother. Now you could say, oops, I'm getting too close to that shoreline. Let's do a reverse prop. I pulled back the throttle to idle and I'll give it a bit of power. Is that cool or what? And that makes sense, you guys. It makes sense that there was a bunch of spray right there in front of me while I was going backwards. Let me just get this thing stabilized again. It actually pushed, the pusher prop was now pushing air towards, you know, towards the front. And it's put all that spray over the windshield. It's pretty cool. No place to land. Why is there a seaplane base here? All right. So now that we're stopped, or we're not stopped yet, almost stopped. Let's just give it a little shot. That'll stop us. And now we can put the anchor out. Ooh, shh. Did you hear that? Decrease power before increasing torque. Hmm. So, um, and maybe that's what exactly was happening. Here comes D Jing in at the same spot, you guys. Yeah, let's get that right while we're while we're still here in in the lesson, you guys. Here comes Andrew also. This is us. Was it D Jing? Yep, there's D Jing coming in. Also, oh, he's in the A five. And Andrew's in 33, yep, 333. So now with the anchor in, you guys, just take a look at this while they're coming in to land. The anchor in. You see the anchors there now off the bow. Look at that. It's beautiful. And there's the anchor retrieval line right there. Beautiful. And then now you would just cut the engine while you're anchored. Remember, while you're anchored, you can do a run-up also, right? Yeah, Flox, it's, it's amazing, man. And we're in Oregon right now. We're at the Juice Goose Playground, where we are. Look at the exhaust coming out, you guys, right here. And the nice exhaust effect there, right? I don't think I'd want to stand on that platform. You actually can't because it is underwater. But one thing that I, I did notice, other than there's Kayla still sitting there with her seatbelt on. One thing I did notice, you guys, is when you open the door, and I've seen some black and white photographs of back in the day, Look how close you are to the water. <laughs> if you've got a few waves, check it out. Look, if you've got a few waves, I'm afraid they're going to have some water in the bilge. And I'm sure they're always pumping water out. And I saw a black and white picture of a fellow with a rowboat sitting right here, picking up somebody who's trying to climb out. And uh, that's one thing you don't get with the float planes that sit higher up on the floats, right? You certainly don't have that problem. Pretty well. All right, let's go back in and close Dido. 
And let's get ready to roll. Where's Andrew? Let's, let's follow Andrew here. Gee whiz, he's always quiet. He kind of slips in there and lands before we even know it. But there he is. I didn't see you land, Andrew. Was it okay? Oh, yeah. Yeah. No problem. You know that little oh, skip no. that I had? No, these are... This is a... This is a fairly easy plane to put in the water. It's... it's... I like that, too. I like that about it. You guys, here's a little nap map. I was just showing you where we're going. I bet you haven't even seen it. We're coming up here. Gee whiz, where are we? We're here. Okay. So here we are. Here's my landing beside the runway. You can't really see it, of course, in the air. And I wasn't looking at little nav map, but it's not bad. Parallel in the way I go. Um, and I'm just saying there should be a bridge here. There isn't. I presume there's a town or something. Why do they have this? And then now we're just going to take off and go back north to the airport right here and do our touch and go right here. Runway 33. That's what I was talking about. And then we're going to just do our touch and go and come up here and around and we're going to land in here and taxi into here and just stay around here. And that's the plan, you guys, for everybody who's involved. And uh, let's go. There's another one in the water. Is it showing? It floats. You got your floats down. We got two of them beside us. Look at that. Yeah, the floats aren't showing in multiplayer. Right? Huh. No, the floats are staying up. You guys have your floats down, right? Interesting. All right, so what I'm going to do, you guys, everything's still running. Fuel pump's still on. I'm going to take off anyway. I'm going to pull the anchor, which look how easy this is. You just click this little icon here. Boom, anchor's back in the boat. Have to make room for my dog, so I'll put it down on the floor. And, uh, and now what I'll do is, let's say I'm close to shore or I'm beached. I'm going to look behind the plane. Open the door, I'm going to yell, prop clear, I'm moving backwards. And uh, and then I'm just going to, poof, and leave it at idle. And let's just see what that looks like. Uh-huh. And then now I'll do... Hmm. Going backwards, that should have... Uh, yeah, I think going backwards, that should have the opposite effect. Oh well. That's the idea. Look at that. And that's at idle, you guys. Is that cooler? I don't think I'd want to speed up going backwards. I don't think it would plane very well. All right, let's get our flaps set. I'm going to do a water takeoff. So you can use a lot of flap. I'm going to use 20. Right there, I'm good. 20 degrees of flap, we're good. Water rudder's in until 45. And if we don't take off by that inlet down there, then we abort. We got lots of room after that inlet right there. Oops. Kind of moving backwards a bit. All right. There's an inlet straight ahead. That's where I'm going. That's the plan. That's not the right inlet. Let's go over this way. Oh, yeah. Right where he is. There's where we're going. That's the inlet way up there. All right. I'm just going to come around to the side. All right. Eugene! Andrew! Well, who's beside me then? So there's an inlet just up here. We got lots of room, you guys. Let's go. Everything's good to go. Gradual forward. Everything's forward. Blue's forward. Red's forward. Throttle's forward. We didn't check our trim. And we'll just do a quick glance at that as we're speeding up. Water rudder comes off because we're going too fast. Beautiful. And my trim is still too high. Should have checked that first. There we go. That's good there. And we got lots of speed for takeoff. Nice gentle pull. Gentle pull. And when you come off the water, don't come back. That's the rule. Don't come back. There we go. Nice pull off. That was it, you guys. If you look at the checklist. Now you can see the inlet up here. If I had more if I needed more distance, I got it. Lots of room up there. Laps up in increments. One. How's that rate of climb? Oh, I'm still way up there, a thousand feet per minute. Laps come up too. How's that rate of climb? We're good. All right. 500 feet's fine, you guys. We're just skimming around. Let's go down the ocean way. What a beautiful place. Let's take up those water floaters. Okay, 
looking good. Request flight following. We don't need flight following, man. All right. Now oh, we'll take it at a thousand. There are some trees. Pulling back some power. Nowhere to where Andrew is, you guys. And here's where Andrew is. He's already at the runway. Oh, you stopped. Okay. We're doing it. We're doing a touch and go. Coming in for a landing. Pulling back power. Remember, now this is for a normal landing. So we want gear down at this speed. That works. Gear is down. There's a bridge. I see a bridge. We do have a bridge. All right. Over on this side. And there's three in the green. One, two, three. Looks good. Start doing flaps now. We're in the flap range. And over here on the left. There's the runway. We're going to do a touch and go, you guys. What do you think? Um, No more than 20 degrees of flaps will be fine. We got lots of runway. What do you think, Andrew? We got 2,000 feet minimum. Probably 3,000 here. Oh, yeah. Looking good. Coming in from base to final. I would announce my final over the radio, but we're fine. There's only Andrew there. Staying at 80 to 90, coming in for landing. Wheels are down, floats are up. Do a quick check out the window. Hey, uh, divers. How you doing? Welcome. Thanks for bringing your friends. Just coming in for a landing. Uh, uh, touch and go, actually. All right, a little bit of a flare. I've got no power. Touching. Get back over in the center. Beautiful. Full power. Flaps up in increments. One, two, three, four, five. Power's good. Everything's forward. Here we go. I'd say that's probably 3,000 feet, Andrew. Everything's cleaned up. Gear up. Nothing left to clean up. We're just heading over to just over my left here, you guys. We're going to land there in the water. Let's just go back to this screen. There's what we were doing, the demonstration. That's what that was. We can go back here and play afterwards and have a lot of fun with it. So big thank you to any builds who is the distributor, um, but specifically to Mario Noriega Fogliani. And that's who you see in here with uh with mario pilot and so um say hi to him in chat and say thank you for such a great product you guys because he did a an excellent job on this it's refined okay. right out the door yeah briggsy yeah when he did the uh, the the photographs for um got friends to do his avatar um he asked them to do the mustache and the helmet from his yeah. World War II incarnation. They couldn't. They couldn't do the helmet, but they did. They did do the mustache. So that's what it was supposed to look like, but they couldn't do the helmet. So they did the sunglasses and the mustache. That's why. <laughs> anyway, this is great. Thank you very much, Mario, for this. Just unbelievable. Any questions you have, you guys, come to our Discord channel and uh, ask the questions of Andrew or I or any anybody that you've seen today. Most of us that you've seen today who were in. In Sim, we're in, we're in Discord and we can chat with each other. We have CFIs in there. You can ask questions. There are sections on ATC questions, Sim questions, real life videos. Our Discord server has grown into quite the resource, you guys. A gift sub. Whoa, Mario Pilot, you are now in the Forder Flying Club. How do you like that? <laughs> Way to go, Andrew. Thanks for that. You're so generous. <laughs> That's so nice. So nice, you guys. Yeah, we know the names of them. Single Coil, I think, is one. Uh, Richard Peak is another one. Um, yeah. Firebird 911 is another one. Zach Gamer is another one. Um, these are all CFIs that we know, you guys, that come and contribute. They also sanity check my lessons, you guys. I, I always pass them by and ask them what they think, and I ask them questions along the way and uh, to make sure everything's right. I'm not a CFI, but I just love aviation, and I do have a teaching background. But uh, I just check with them, and I check with manuals too, so we make sure everything is right. And in the sim, you don't have to be a, CF, a CFI. 
and thanks all for the same love of aviation. See you again soon. Night, everybody.